All right. Well, this is going to be my first attempt at a podcast without David. Uh, and we're going to see how it works, if it works at all. Because usually David guides and directs and keeps me on point and all of the things that David does so well. <clears throat> um, but today, I'm going to try and do one by myself. We'll see if it works. <coughs> and uh, what I want to talk to you today is about the uh, why it's valuable to study uh, literature and understand literature and be able to read literature well, why that's valuable and um, how that we can take that into our Bible reading and it becomes particularly valuable as we learn to embrace uh, the scriptures as literature, the, the way they're intended to be read. And a lot of times it makes us nervous to even talk about that because the people that first started to say, uh, to, to talk about scripture as literature in in many of our lives were people that were trying to deny the historicity of literature, to deny that it actually really happened, that sort of thing. But um, the reality is history, uh, his, his, historical literature, literature telling us about history is uh, one of the literatures. And if the Bible is perfect literature, then it's going to give us perfect historical literature. And um, that's one of the things that I want to look at today is how can we come to uh, the literature of the Bible? I mean, we're going to look at Exodus 5 and see uh, the literary way that uh, that uh, the, the scriptures are being written and how that shows us um, truths from the scriptures that if we don't learn to read literature, read poetically, read visually, the, the those sorts of things, then we miss uh, things that are being communicated to us by God's word, which is true and infallible and and uh, whatever whatever the strongest possible wording is right now for the uh, authoritative and perf- perfect nature of the scriptures. And uh, Exodus 5 is a really interesting example because Exodus 5 is, uh, is a section that doesn't really have a good... Uh, it doesn't really have a victory in it. Um, at, Moses and Aaron go in to talk to Pharaoh for the first time. <coughs> and Moses and Aaron go talk to Pharaoh and tell him that the Lord God of Israel uh, has said, I want you to let my people go because they're going to go out three days into the wilderness and we're going to have a feast to the Lord out in the wilderness. Now, already right off the bat, that's a strange thing because you don't go to the wilderness for a feast. You usually go to the farm or you go to the the place where the food is, but he, where they're going to be taken out into the wilderness to feast. And so it begins by giving you um, a, a key. The, the key to the story is right in the beginning. We're going to go out to the wilderness uh, for a feast. And Pharaoh says, I don't know this Lord. Now we know that this is the time when uh, a pharaoh arises that doesn't know the Lord, right? And here we got the evidence of it, the proof of it. He says, I don't know the Lord. I'm not going to let Israel go. And um, he, they say, well, but the God of the Hebrews has told you to. He And he has authority over you to tell you to do this. And he denies it. Um, and this is just the very beginning of this uh uh, of what is going on here is he denies that he, that the authority is real. Um, the, and um, what is really uh, interesting is this is the, where the, the bricks without straw um, comes in. He says, I'm going to make it worse for you because I, and for the people of Israel, because of what their God has said, their God says, they're going to go feast. Well, I'll show them. They're not going to go feast. Not only are they not going to go feast, their work is going to get harder. Now, it's amazing that this happens here because um, it doesn't benefit Pharaoh to make his slaves less productive, right? But out of spite, um, a, a, out of spite for God and out of the hardness of his heart and and out of the his service to idols, um, he's actually ruining his own business as well. And I, I find that just fascinating the way serving idols always ends up destroying us as well. Right. Um, there, there's, 
lots and lots of stories of this, even in our own lives of the times that we, um, we get caught up with some, with an idol and, uh, it, it ends up destroying us too. It doesn't make it better, but we double down. And that's what happens here is Pharaoh doubles down with his idol. And he says, you're going to have to make bricks without straw. So the, the bricks get worse, harder to make, take longer. His slaves don't get as much done in the day. Um, and he thinks of that as a victory, right? Less, his business is less productive. And he thinks of that as a victory. And that this might remind you of something. I just saw this week with the, the NBA making a big deal um, out of LGBTQ. And you think, this doesn't benefit your business at all. So you're, you, you um, are, you're not focusing on your business and you're instead, you're focusing on um, this, this other thing um, that actually is destructive to your business. Right. So, um, you know, it's similar to Disney uh, paying for abortions. You think but children are your main source of, of audience and you're going to, you want less of them in the world. That's, that's a self-destructiveness that always comes with idolatry. Um, but if you're seeing this from the perspective of God's people, what they do is they say, Moses, you're making it worse for us. Moses, you're the one making it worse for us. Now, Pharaoh really is the one making it worse, um, but he's blaming Moses and the people of God uh, trust the, their slave, their slave owner, or the, they trust their their owner as slaves um, to tell them what is going on. Uh, when in fact Moses is there to help to make it better to take them out to feast in the wilderness with their God to bring them back to the promised land, and uh, and Pharaoh says, "No, your worth, your life is getting harder because of what Moses is doing. It's not getting easier." But the reality is, it is because this is the beginning of the destruction of Egypt. Right? This is the beginning of the hardening of the heart of Pharaoh. This is this is the beginning, um, and it, it and what we see is that the shape that God brings His people through is a resurrection shape. He brings them down through the death of this difficulty in order to bring them to the the freedom. Uh, the, the, they, they have to go through this death in order to go to get to the freedom because all freedom is really resurrection freedom. So, because you get to the end and it says, Mos- um, there's, let's see if I can show you this. I opened up my Bible this morning. Uh, I had my pen in this, uh, in this mark here. And, uh, You can see, oh, it's, it's not, oh yeah, there we go. You can see that uh, I have my pen marking chapter five in Exodus. And you have, uh, I opened it up and there's a stink bug there in my Bible. So let's see, we'll, I'll t- it's on, I'll tell you what passage it's on. It's on the passage. And they met Moses and Aaron and stood in the way as they uh, came forth from Pharaoh. All right, so there was a bug standing in the way there. Um, I thought that was funny. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, and and they said they said to Moses, um, "The Lord look upon you and judge, because you have made our savor to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh." Um, in in the let's see if I can make this work. Like I can put the Bible up on the screen. It's kind of cool. Um, the uh, what it so yeah uh, what it says is um, you know that uh, here this is the New King James. Let the Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to kill us. And so Moses returns to the Lord and says, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. Uh, And the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will let them go. With a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. Right? He... What he's doing is he is showing 
that Pharaoh is his puppet, right? Pharaoh is in, is in his hand, um, that Pharaoh is going to harden his heart. And because of that, now Pharaoh is going to end up uh, bringing these plagues onto himself and continually doubling down and doubling down. And each plague uh, is going to come up against one of the gods of Egypt, one of the things that they trust for their provision or their protection or their identity, which is how we discover our idols. We look for what do we think is providing for us, protecting us, gives us our identity, tells us our history, our future, those sorts of things. And we find our idols. Well, here, Pharaoh is going to now put each of his idols up against the Lord God. And um, and God is going to bring down all 10, 10 of the idols, like one, he's going to step on each one, one for each toe. And uh, through all of that, at the end, he's Pharaoh is going to send them away, right? So he's it's not enough for them to just go. Um, the, Pharaoh is actually going to send them away. And that is one of the uh, amazing things about the way God sets the, this story up, right? Is he sends them through a death in order to get to the resurrection, right? Some, a greater, uh, there's a, a greater life that they receive, a greater going, a greater return from exile that they receive because they went through this death together. That's the, the shape that God has built into the world. Now, if you remember previously, before this happens in the book of Exodus, Moses has gone through the same death and resurrection shape in his life. He's going to be the leader that takes his, takes Israel's uh, people through the wilderness into the promised land, which is another death and resurrection, right? It, you have to go through the water, through the wilderness in order to get to the promised land because uh, the, the blessings are resurrection shaped that he has to give to them. But uh, Moses, in order to be ready to go uh, to lead God's people, he first has to go through this death and resurrection. He's the one that goes out into the wilderness for 40 years, spends 40 years going through the, the wilderness himself in order to come back and be ready to be a leader. Um, the, when God calls somebody to lead God's lead his people, he puts them through these deaths and resurrections in order to give them the wisdom that they need to be able to lead God's people well. And so here we've got Moses going through a death and resurrection so that he can show up, not to bring God's people straight to the resurrection, but to lead them through the death and resurrection, right? So we're beginning to see this shape of death and resurrection that's a literary uh, shape um, that he goes, you know, we see it throughout Genesis when um, Joseph is being prepared to lead the largest empire in the world. God sends him um, first into a well, then into an underground prison. Right? He keeps going through deaths and resurrections in order to uh, be raised up. And ultimately, we're going to see uh, that there's an ultimate death and resurrection uh, in Christ Jesus, right? He, that's where, so when God's son comes and reveals the father to us, reveals what God is like, we see that he goes through the death and resurrections, revealing to us that from all eternity, that that shape of new life, um, of resurrection life is something that, that is actually revealed to us uh, about who God is, right? That God is a self-giving God. That, um, that God is a God who seeks the benefit uh, of others, right? The Father seeks the benefit of the Son and, and the, the benefit of the Spirit. And, and all of that is, is a, a, a type of uh, resurrection logic, resurrection wisdom, right? Um, and then the, the uh, or maybe it's the anti-type and we're the type, you know, depending on how you think of it. But but the allegorical nature of reality reflecting who God is, um, the transpositional nature of reality, which is what C.S. Lewis calls it, right? Where he says, you see in a great, huge symphony, and then later you hear somebody play that symphony on the piano. It says, well, the, the symphony is the triune nature of God, right? God's life. We are that life, the, all of creation is that life played on the piano, right? And then, you know, we are that played on a penny flute or something like that, right? We as individuals, right? All of creation together, the, the sun, the moon, the stars, uh, heaven, earth, hell, all of it working together uh, is, a, is a piano compared to the symphony of God's nature as the triune um, creator that's 
lived in a community of love from all eternity, right? That is the, the, that is the symphony. And eventually we are brought into that symphony, but we're trained in, uh, into that life, into that family life. We're trained into that family resemblance by going through the deaths and resurrections of our life, right? They, and because of the fall, those deaths and resurrections, one of the things that they do is they grow us up out of our sin, right? They sanctify us. They set us apart more and more um, to life rather than uh, to our devotion to sin and to death. Um, but it's not in a w- but what is amazing about the way the, um, the, you know, in sort of a literary irony um, that God writes the story is that he pulls out of the out of the thing that what um, that we brought onto ourselves as a curse? He ends up even turning that in his love. He flips it around, flips it inside out, and turns it into a blessing. This is a a poem from Gerard Manley Hopkins. Um, I have I this every man's uh, pocket poetry library. I've been picking these up for a long time, and I try to always be carrying um, some poetry around. So if I have a little bit of time here and there, I can pick it up and meditate on some poetry and grow in my uh, ability to read really is, is, um, you know, the, you, the reason that you study grammar as a little kid is so that you can read poetry as you get older, right? Poetry is the point. It's the, it's the, the place that you're being brought to. It's, it's for adults, right? This is what adult reading looks like. Um, and when we're young, we read grammar and, uh, we, we learn grammar so that we can grow up and, and, read poetry. And this is a poem called New Readings. And Gerard Manley Hopkins is one of the harder poets in English, but one of the most satisfying because of the depth of his, uh, the, the depth of his meditation on reality that go, and then the, um, the depth of his communication of reality right, in a, is a, in a transformative way. So New Readings. Although the letter said on thistles that men look not to grapes to gather. I, I, Nah, I'm going to start over. <laughs> New readings. Although the letter said on thistles that men look not grapes to gather, I read the story rather how soldiers plating thorns around Christ's head, grapes grew and drops of wine were shed. Though when the sower sowed, the winged fowls took part, part fell in thorn and never turned to corn, part found no root upon the flinty road, Christ at all hazards fruit hath showed. From wastes of rock he brings food for five thousand. On the thorns he shed grains from his drooping head, and would not have that legion of winged things bear him to heaven on easeful wings. This is an amazing poem, just not just because of the beauty of the the language, right? The 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 rhythm he he does a polyrhythmic thing with the accents in the words, and then another rhythm over the top of it with the sounds of the words, the assonance of the words. And so you've got something polyrhythmic, really similar um, to the way, you know, um, somebody like J. Cole would rap or somebody um, like Busta Rhymes would rap where he he often will layer um, a couple of different rhythms over top of one another. Uh, he, and, or Rakim, you know, the, the really, really great uh, rappers, they do the same thing that Gerard Manley Hopkins is doing here, um, where they layer two rhythms on top of one another. Uh, and, and they, uh, you know, Rakim's book about creativity, which is really a good read. He, he explains how he had to invent a way to do this because there wasn't any, um, that he didn't have his, oh, he didn't have a way of marking out the rhythms within language. And so he had to invent a grid system that he could write with. Well, they used to have a system of, of marking out the, the rhythms, you know, the feet of a poem, uh, the accents of a poem. You know, you've got the, so the, he just wasn't aware of it, but he's right in line in, in the history of English poetry, um, right, uh, right in line with early, um, new modern poetry, right? So that's where, what Gerard Manley Hopkins is doing is early, uh, late Victorian, early modern poetry. Well, what Rakim is doing is right, th- he, he lands right there, right? In that uh, late Victorian, early modern poetry where you they start playing with rhythms 
um, using Anglo-Saxon rhythms, the Anglo, which is the marking out the rhythms of the la- uh, the the accents of the language, um, and then also marking out. So instead of counting syllables, you count the accents within a word. Um, and the, the Beastie Boys were really good at this. Eminem's really good at this. Uh, but uh, Rakim actually explains how he does it in his book. Um, and it's in here, you've got Gerard Mayley Hopkins doing the same thing uh, that where he's layering two different, two different counting mechanisms uh, on top of one another. But, but the reason that he is using that form <clears throat> because it rhymes as well, but the reason that he's using that form is because of the way that God is writing the poem of history in a layered sort of way. Right. He says, he says, although the letter said on thistles that men look not grapes to gather, right? Men don't go to a thistle bush to get grapes, right? And we're told that, right? That's true. He says, in the story, as God tells it, rather, soldiers put on Christ's head thorns, and then he bled, and drops of wine were shed, right? So he's talking about the way that the blessing, God brings blessing out of the thorns that are, uh, that are the symbol of the curse, right? You don't go to grapes. You don't go to thorns to get grapes. Um, You go to a grape bush, right? But here God says, but I can bring grapes. I can bring wine out of thorns, right? He he brings the blood of Christ, which is our salvation um, through these thorns, uh, on his head, on Christ's head, and then he says, "When the sower sowed, the winged fowls took some, and some fell in thorns, uh, and they never turned to they they never took root. Uh, part falls on the flinty road, um, and you know, amongst the stones, and they and it doesn't grow up corn, right? It doesn't grow up grain, and we know that that's true, and and the parable says that. But then it says, from wastes of rock." Christ bring, brings forth food for 5,000. On the thorns, he shed grains from his drooping head, right? So he, he says these things, uh, you know, the, the stoniness of a rock is a, a curse when it's considered, you know, uh, it, we, you know we're, we're told that before God comes along with his spirit, we have hearts of stone. He replaces our hearts of stone with hearts of flesh. We're, we're told that thorns are a curse. We're told that uh, the, the, rocks on the road are the wrong place to grow grain. And, and he says, but that's exactly what God ends up doing, right? He transforms our <clears throat> stony hearts into flesh. He brings forth water from the rock. He brings forth food from the rock that is Christ. Uh, and on the, th- and then he, from his drooping head, grains fall, fall forth because he, he, you know, he gives, himself in his, this is a communion metaphor right he gives himself to us in communion but he gives he can give himself to us in broken bread because his body was broken right his body broken is the the real thing and then the metaphor is the bread the the communication of the of the thing itself is through the the, the metaphor of bread and wine um through the you know the uh the the spirit of Christ gives us Christ himself in the bread and the wine. Um, but he could do that because Christ gave himself on uh, the the cross for his body to be broken. And so he says, he, and Christ would not have that legion of winged things, angels, bear him to heaven on easeful wings. Right? He um, Christ could have been born to heaven the easy way, and he just refuses, right? He's not going to take a route that he, that, um, different from the people that are going to take that route, that are going to follow him, are going to take that route, right? Uh, God's provision, we see, is always resurrection provision, right? God gives resurrection pro- uh, provision, Um. <coughs> Christ was, uh, he, he was, uh, giving himself, but he gives 
uh, himself the way God has always given himself, right? So uh, the the uh, death that Christ goes through in order to provide us with life provides us with life that we gain through death. Right? He he never changes the pattern. So we see it in uh, we see it in Joseph. We see it in Moses. We see it in God's people coming out of the Exodus. We see it in Jesus. We and it, but it's a it, it's the literary shape of the story that shows it to us. It's um, it, it it isn't something that throughout the Old Testament that God just comes out and says. Now, eventually, we do get to Second uh, Corinthians. Where Paul, who's been studying all his life, he's been studying these uh, the the law. He's been studying these things, um, and <coughs> he's been studying and seeing um, the this pattern. He comes to us, in, or he writes in in Second Corinthians, "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ." The Second Corinthians. Uh, one three, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Right? He turns us into people that can comfort by sending us through difficulties and comforting us, and then we see people go through difficulties, and we are able to be. Uh, comforters because we've been comforted, but you can't be comforted unless you go through affliction. So comfort, being a comforter is a resurrection reality, right? God turns us into comforters in the resurrection of his, uh, uh, of taking us through difficulty and bringing us out the other side, consoling and comforting us. Um, and so that's why Paul says that, uh, we he he said he can be afflicted for their consolation, but he can be he can endure suffering so that he can be a comforter to them. Um, that his comfort is the salvation of uh, is the consolation of his of God's people. Now uh, <clears throat> this is but here's a really really interesting section. You know the. In verse eight, he says, for we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure above strength so that we despaired even of our life. Right. So sometimes people will say, oh, God doesn't give us more than we can handle. Paul disagrees. He said God gave us beyond what we could handle. It was beyond our strength, beyond measure. We despaired even of our life. He says, yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in a God who raises the dead. Right. So he says, God sent affliction and difficulty and trouble to force our eyes up, saying only God's resurrection, only the resurrecting God could save us now. Right. Because the sentence of death is upon us. The, 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 the weight of our trials and our tribulations is beyond our strength. It has crushed us, but God raises the dead. And, and, but it begins by the, the afflictions producing in us, our eyes look up to Christ, see him resurrected, see that the spirit resurrects people from the dead. Um, and then says, well, he can deliver us from this death too. He's a, a resurrecting God. He delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us and whom we trust that he will still deliver us. So he says, so help by praying for us, right? Pray for our resurrection in the, in the midst of our difficulties and suffering. And this, so uh, this pattern of, uh, real life being resurrection life of real wisdom being resurrection wisdom of real faith being resurrection faith of real hope being resurrection hope is something that it's it comes from the nature of who god is from before he created and it and it is uh 
something that's embedded within the creation. And then it's just embedded everywhere around us, right? Every year, my trees drop all their leaves out in the front yard. I have to rake them up and, um, and this, you know, bring them to the clean green section of the dump and, you know, all of that. Uh, and then wait through the winter for the, the, uh, trees to come back to life. Uh, the, the, bears and all of the animals that hibernate they go into uh their hibernation every uh fall and winter and then they come out in the spring that's the first book that i did with jessica evans was a book about about uh uh hibernating animals right and it's, it's about animals hibernating and waiting for waiting through winter is what it's called and it's amazing you know i got notes from around the country from people that said, thank you so much for this book. My, um, my, my parents died and this book really helped us get through it with our kids because it helped them understand, uh, that, that, uh, you know, understand death, right? You think, well, that's so amazing. It's about hibernating animals, but we are built in such a way that we can see and understand the allegory that God has built into the world, right? That the world is this living allegory that's all around us. Um, so we see it, we see it embedded in uh, that. We see that God has impressed upon nature, upon creation, um, the, the rhythms of death and resurrection. Uh, and then even, you know, within the life of a, of of an individual, right? We're born babies. And then we, we, as we grow up, we go into the springtime of our lives. We go through puberty. We have kids, we get married, we have kids. And then, um, the, the, the summertime, you know, as we're, as we're raising our kids and then our kids start to move out and we go into the fall of life and then into the winter of life. Um, but a life that's well lived that winter now is filled that winter part of life is filled with all kinds of resurrection wisdom that we get to pass on to the next generation right and so all of that all of the the living through the deaths and resurrections of life and the overarching uh death into resurrection pattern of our life should be new life to those that come on after us because it's not just comfort that we pass on, right? We also pass on all kinds of new wisdom. And, um, and you know, th this is something that our, that, that, uh, hopefully our kids get to experience the, um, the, you know, you're not as strong as an old man or not as strong as an old woman. You're not as handsome or as beautiful as an old man, as an old woman, but the internal, the internal life, should be rich, um, and and a lot of that just comes from how we spent our life. You know, with the um, what what chains we linked together week in and week out in our life leads to one or the other. Um, lead leads to a, a life filled with wisdom at the end that we can pass on, or a life um, filled with regret, right? And, that, and that's a real thing. But even that regret, we can see God turn it into wisdom when it comes with repentance, right? There's, um, it's never, he, he's never uh, done with us in that sense, right? We can always with turn uh, even regrets into blessings for the next generation with repentance and an openness to tell our stories. And uh, <coughs> so, um, you know, the, this, and, and, you know, this, this is one of the reasons I'm really excited about pub university it, to teach, um, literature to, to be teaching, uh, a literary, uh, a lit, to teach literary reading, to grow in our, um, to, to teach literacy, um, is because it affects the way we see the Bible. It affects our ability to enjoy some of the best things in life. You know, the, the literature of mankind, the poetry of mankind is one of our great inheritances as Christians. When, um, when we're told that in Christ, all things are our inheritance. One of those great things is the, the uh, literature and uh, poetry of mankind. We don't have access to it if we, without some education, right? Without committing to um, growing in that way. 
And a, a lot of the uh, you know things that have been the greatest joys in my life have been uh, the ways that literature has opened up reality and poetry has opened up reality and changed the way I see and changed the way uh, my family does things. Right? Um, the the seeing the way. Uh, for example, Jane Austen has just transformed my wife over the years and given her so much wisdom and her ability to to pick out and help people because she knows how character, you know, she she knows what kind of character, um, what kind of things grow character, what kind of things shrink character. She knows what kind of things, uh, what, what kind of people to uh, avoid or how to tell people which direction they should and shouldn't go because of the time she spent with Jane Austen. And so she's been able to, to help a lot of people um, because of the way that she's, you know, spent her time literarily speak her literary, literary time. And so, um, you know, I, I'm really looking forward to, you know, the, the classes, which the first couple of classes are uh, up and ready for registration. Um, the mission of God for the family. So that one is about uh, how to, move from a defensive posture as a family to an offensive posture as a family. What is it that God has called our families to accomplish? Um, and not just try and hide and avoid the influences of the world, but to become a family that influences the world. That So um, that's I'm really excited about that one, the mission of God for the family. And then uh, the other one that's open for um, registration but it doesn't start until December is uh, apologetics one. So I've been teaching apologetics for a long time. And so I'm excited to, to condense down what I've learned um, into eight lessons uh, if it's, if it's possible and, um, and have some fun learning apologetics uh, together and um, evangelistic apologetics in particular. And uh, the, yeah, those are open and ready. So hop over and sign up if you uh, are, are want to. Um, and I think I'm going to wrap it up there without David. Uh, I, I don't even know if what I said makes any sense or not, if, if it was uh, straightforward enough to make sense. So um, have a great uh, rest of the week and uh, see you back at Knox Unplugged next week.